is therefore a great pleasure to be here and uh, to introduce you to my new book, which is uh, called Pain and Prejudice, and um, which I'm going to tell you about. And I couldn't, because it's an academic group, I usually do readings, but because it's an academic group, I thought I had to do a PowerPoint, but it's got lots of pictures. So, um, and the first question that I need to answer, and I don't know if you can see these pictures, but there are lots of workers in the pictures. Um, and they're from different countries because when I do bike trips, I usually bring my camera. And we usually do take pictures of, of workers. So there's just a lot of workers that I've contacted over the years. And <clears throat> so I wrote this book to kind of digest uh, 35 years of thinking about occupational health and safety research. But also, and I'm going to read you one passage, and it's going to be about this, is that I, my own my life as a highly paid scientific worker studying lower paid workers, and what this class difference that, that we, I came across daily meant for my own understanding of occupational health. So I'm going to start out with my father. Uh, and my first experience with, with low paid workers who in fact probably had a lot of occupational health and safety problems. When I was little, my father took me for a morning to the factory where he was an executive. To my delight, he let me sit at the line and watch the women wiring radios. The red, blue, and yellow wires had to be soldered in the right places in each radio. The women even let me play with the colored wires while my father was busy. This occupied me for a while, but then I got down off my chair and went to see my father in his office. I had something on my mind. I asked him, don't they get bored doing the same thing all day? And he replied, no, they don't. They're not, like, they're not smart like you, Karen. I was floored. My father was telling me that these grown-up women who were not as smart as me, a five-year-old who had a pretty good idea of my low rank in society. What he was saying didn't seem too plausible, but he seemed to be sure of what he said. I puzzled over this for a while and never forgot it. Many years later, circumstances conspired to suggest to me that my father might have been mistaken about the intelligence of workers. And I described when I started working in a restaurant <clears throat> and was trying to figure out how to take all these orders at once and keep it straight who had ordered what and, and what had to have a piece of parsley put on it and, and everything. And I realized that the people who were doing this job were able to do uh, cognitive tasks that I found extremely challenging. And I can describe some of this in the book. But anyway, that, this, this class co uh, conflict or, or this, this another way to put it, I guess, would be contempt uh, is something that I had in my background and that kind of dogged me uh, the whole time that I was doing research in occupational health and safety in partnership with workers' organizations. And so the book came out of that malaise uh, that, I was, that I was feeling. So what is the book? Uh, I'm not going to detail all the, the, the stuff. You should buy it and read it. Um, and, but it, it, the first seven chapters are about workers, and they're about specific studies that we've done of workers. The first one is when I used to be a molecular geneticist, and I'll tell you about it in a minute. And then because of my terrible experiences being a molecular geneticist, I went and got retrained in ergonomics. And the, uh, following uh, six chapters are about different ergonomic studies that we've been doing. Um, and then the second half of the book uh, is about uh, science and my reflections on the, on the actual science of it from the point of view of what did I learn from workers, what are the questions that the workers gave me, and how are people who um, take what Joan Egan would call the standpoint of workers, how does that uh, different from uh, people who take this, you know, sci scientists who take a standpoint of employers or of high paid workers. Um, and so there's a bunch of reflections on that. And chapter eight, I put it in parentheses because you either hate it or you love it. Um, and it could be a gender difference. Uh, it's all about me uh, and what it was like being a, a woman scientist in the 1970s. And so some people think it's very 
personal and they didn't, and they didn't uh, care about all that stuff that I went through with being a single mom trying to get a PhD in science. Um, and so you can skip that. You have my permission to skip that, because about half people hate it. Um, the rest is, is really reflections on science. And then chapter 11, I really tried to give it a happy ending. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later, um, because that's one of the uh, things I'd like to hear from you about is, is there a happy ending somewhere? Does somebody see something to be optimistic about? The message of the book is uh, that it's hard for people who are not low-paid workers to see, hear, or understand what their work is like or what effects it has. Scientists like me um, are not low-paid workers, or at least most scientists are not low-paid workers or don't uh, spend their days with low-paid workers. For scientists to understand occupational health, it, would help, it, it will help if there's a context that forces us to observe, listen, and understand. And I've been in a very specific context, uh, which you may or may not know about, uh, which is that uh, the uh, University of Quebec in Montreal, which is where I uh, work, uh, or where I worked when I, before I was retired, and I can often be found there um, doing volunteer work. Uh, in 1976, uh, the University of Quebec si signed an agreement with the three major trade unions in Quebec, uh, the CSN, the FTQ, and the uh, CSQ. And they agreed that the unions could ask for uh, training or research uh, in the context of the agreement and that there would be a certain amount of money set aside so that this could be done. And uh, so that, for example, if I gave, and I have done, um, say, uh, 45 hours of training uh, of cleaners, uh, hospital cleaners, in uh, how to protect themselves against cleaning agents and how to uh, protect themselves against uh, musculoskeletal disorders, and the course content is approved by a committee at the university, then I get forgiven 45 hours of teaching uh, undergraduate biology. So, uh, so that's one part of it. And the other thing is that there's seed money for research projects, and this is wonderful because it, it means you can do that stage of doing the bibliography and doing pre preliminary data uh, compilation so that you can write a real grant request. And uh, that uh, money, again, comes from a committee at the university that does sort of peer review on it. And, um, and then in 1993, there was a specific agreement between our research center and the unions, this is when it got signed over here. I wish I had a pointer, but I don't, but I guess I have a finger. That may work, yeah. So um, this, these are all the presidents of our union confederations uh, and the rector, of, the vice rector of our university signing an agreement so that we would do research on women's occupational health. So that's the context, and this is the mommy and daddy of, of our agreement. This is Donna Mergler and Michelle Lise, who thought up this idea in the first place. And so given that context, it means that I've been in contact with direct representations of workers' needs for research. And for those of you who are doing research, um, you may realize that this is a really cool way to find out the latest thing that's happening in the workplace and what are going to be the new questions that are going to be posed. So that we heard about precarious work in the mid-1990s. Which was, and we were at that time about the first people that were hearing about it. And similarly, other other questions, other interesting scientific questions, we've been right on, able to be right on top of them. But this is my first experience, and okay, you have to. It's 1978, so I'm whatever it is, uh, 37 years younger, uh, and uh, and so I'm a little. Not a little kid, but I'm not very old. I'm not very experienced. This is the first time I've ever been in contact with humans, because my PhD thesis is on fungal genetics and how to improve uh, a, a genetic uh, a a, um, a fungus so that it will kill more mosquitoes. Okay, and I'm called up by the university office that does this um, union collaboration, and they're saying. Well, you're the only geneticist 
that we got at the university, and the, here are these people wanting to know what happens to them if they're exposed to radioactive dust. And the way they learn it is the workers learned that they were exposed to radioactive dust, and this is a very typical in occupational health and safety that the concern came from the public and, and an environmental group. And what happened was that the dust that they were using, they sold, the factory sold it the, after it had been used up, like the, the tailings. They sold it to the province, and the province used it to make roads. And somebody calculated that if you, if a com commuter drove over the road so and so many minutes per day, that they would be exposed to such and such much of radioactive, uh, radioactivity. And, uh, and so the workers thought about this and they said, but we work with this stuff all day. We got our hands in it, we were breathing it, it's on our faces, it's on our bodies, what's happening to us? And there was no newspaper article about that, but they, were worried about it. So they called the university. The university called me. And I said I had to go, I would accept to go out there and talk to them. And so there is a, it's a long story in the book. And I'm, I, Peter said I wasn't going to talk very long. And he was, that's because I told him I wasn't going to talk very long. So to give you get, uh, time to ask questions. So I'm going to try not to talk to very long. So I'll just give you the bottom line, which is we had to re, engineer our lab and I had to recruit some fantastic students and we did a little, this is 1978 so we don't have really wonderful techniques for looking at whether workers' chromosomes are da damaged but we managed to find some evidence that makes us think that their chromosomes are damaged but we aren't feeling very sure of ourselves because you know, this is not my field, they're not fungus, <laughs> fungi, they're, they're people and I don't know much about people. so. Uh, we go with our preliminary results saying, well, I don't know, but maybe, and, and the companies, uh, I was not at that time familiar with how companies deal with the rumor that there might be a problem, which is that they said, okay, we'll put in a new ventilation system if the union will, will stop uh, having anything to do with you. And the union said, oh, that's a great idea. And so we were out. And, uh, and the bottom line is, that despite the fact that some workers, and particularly the younger workers, and particularly one guy whose face I can see before me to this day, whose fiance broke up with him because he had some indications of chromosomal damage that we had no idea whether it was going to really be meaningful or not, but we were made by our, our ethics committee to tell him that he had this result and his fiance broke up with him. So he would have liked to know if he was really had a problem. Anyway, we, they will never know. Uh, but there were a lot of malformed kids among the kids of those people. So that was my very first, very rough introduction to occupational health and, and safety research. Um, so at, <coughs> there's dots there because there's a chapter two in which I discuss why and how, uh, based on some questions from a group of cleaners in a hospital in, in Montreal, I decided I would be more useful doing ergonomics than um, molecular genetics. And uh, anyway, you can read about it. But the next thing we look at is um, prolonged standing, which has been a subject I've been interested in many years. And it came from a case that Nicole Vizina, my colleague, uh, who's an ergonomist, she was asked to answer the question, can cashiers work uh, sitting down? Now, anybody who's European, there, I don't know if there are any, um, knows that in almost every other country in the world, uh, supermarket cashiers work sitting down. So it's pretty funny, but in Quebec there's a law, and the law says that the employer has to provide a seat for any worker whose job will allow them to work sitting. And so the, uh, there was this cashier uh, on the north, upper north shore of uh, the St. Lawrence River who had backache, and she said she wanted to sit. And she, uh, her union supported her because there was this regulation. And the company said, well, you can't do a job, everybody else, you can't do a job of a cashier sitting down because uh, everybody in Quebec and in Canada and in, in the United States uh, does that job standing up. And so Nicole went and studied it and found, well, you know, you could do it sitting down. And it was a really good idea. And the worker won her case. And the question is, why is it that in July when I went to take that picture up at the corner of my street, that woman is still standing. 
I don't know if you can make it out, but anyway, there's, I, I'm sure you've seen cashiers here standing. So, um, and I made this part a little bit longer than in the book because you're probably, a lot of you know some epidemiology. Uh, so you've probably seen uh, stuff like this article here, and it's reducing sitting time, the new workplace health priority. Um, and uh, what we hear about if we're an upper class worker is that sitting is really, really bad for you. And every time I see one of these articles, I get very, very upset because it, and I don't mean to, I jog, okay? I, I ride my bike uh, 5,000 kilometers a year. I do believe in exercise. But <laughs> standing being a cashier is not exercise. It's static. Um, and the question is, how come sciences, scientists are giving a priority to this when there are all these people like hotel receptionists and bank tellers and and supermarket cashiers who are standing and their legs are hurting and their backs are hurting and and we've even shown this and with other and other people have shown uh, bad things about standing and yet what comes out in the newspapers is uh, and in the in the journals a lot is that sitting is really really bad for you so there's some technical issues and this is uh, one is that if you look at those studies, the control group for sitting is standing, or sometimes it's sedentary behavior, and it's, which is variously defined. And uh, standing is really, it doesn't exist, okay? Whoops. This is standing. She's standing, okay? She's standing, I don't know if you can tell, but she's kind of, this is a teacher bent over the desk of his kids. This is a hockey player running, skating around. She's cleaning a toilet. She's a bank teller in a place where they have stools, but you can't use them because you need to pull out a drawer. So you would be standing up every minute. Uh, this is another uh, supermarket cashier. This is a technician installing things. These people are all standing. So standing is a number of different postures. And some of them are dynamic and some of them are static. And it's an important difference physiologically. So that's one of the technical points. Another technical point, and I've just been discussing this with Peter, who has more expertise than I do on this, but um, if you, a lot of people adjust for gender in their, in their studies of physiological effect, and, and those sitting versus standing studies are an example. Well, if the people who are doing static standing are more often women, and that's true in Quebec, at least, uh, and the people who are doing more dynamic standing are men, when you adjust for gender, you're adjusting for static standing. Okay, I don't know if that's clear to everybody, but if I'll take questions on it later. So that you can um, make uh, the difference between static and dynamic standing disappear. And therefore, it looks like sitting is more favorable. So that's another problem. And there's a third constraint, which you really only know about if you talk to workers, and it was from talking to workers in a factory that we became uh, sensitized to the fact that if you are having a job that where you're standing all day, it's really important. Sometimes workers like to stand. Sometimes they feel um, that it um, gives them a better, like bank tellers hesitate to sit when they're faced with somebody who could be a bank robber. They'd rather be standing and ready to run. Um, but what they really like is to have a chair there if they need it, if they perceive a signal from their body that says it would be good to sit down for a little while now. Um, so there's this notion of constraint. And that's the thing that distinguishes low paid workers and highly paid workers is the degree of control that they have over their posture. And that is a variable that, that really very, very few studies have looked at. So again, all of this is, the, the reason I'm doing this in detail is, is that when you think about things from the point of view, or as Joan would say, the standpoint of the worker, um, the scientific question changes. And it's very important for us as scientists to be aware that the scientific question changes. And then now to skip to chapter six, uh, which I call home invasion. And I think you can tell from this schedule why I call it that. It's, this is a, uh, one of the first groups that asked us about 
<coughs> to look into the effects of work schedules. And this is what, how schedules are made in the service sector now is, and we'll go back to that grocery store, um, they take the figures from the cash registers uh, on 15 minute intervals. They put them in a computer and the computer spits out the schedules based on how many workers you need for that 15 minute period. So you can see that it makes these schedules that are really weird, right? Well, this person starts work at 9 o'clock on Monday, at 9.15 on Tuesday, she gets Wednesday off, she starts again at 9.15 on Thursday, then she works at you know, 4 o'clock on Friday and so forth, and then, then a day off here, a day off there, three days in a row at 5 o'clock. If you think about this from the point of view of somebody who has to get daycare for their kids, uh, what we found was that these, uh, in a group of 30 workers with children uh, 12 or under, the kids had up to eight different um, people taking care of them over a two-year period, a two-week period, sorry. <laughs> a little difference, two-week period. So it's, it's a really impossible situation that is becoming more and more common. We were asked to do studies by uh, telephone operators, retail sales staff, and industrial cleaners, all of whom have this kind of schedule. And I was talking about it with Peter because he's got young kids. And, and I was telling him that we had one more woman just a couple of weeks ago say to us, well, she, had a, uh, she has a handicapped kid and she has to go to the doctor all the time with this kid and she's a single parent. And how she worked it out was <clears throat> that she took the night shift because there's not, you know, if you work from 12 to 8, there's not that much competition. Uh, she's an industrial cleaner. And I said, well, when do you sleep? And she said, well, uh, when I can. When we, uh, we've just published uh, the results of one of these studies, which is with a retail sales organization. And they, in response to the study, they did create some regular full-time jobs. But they told us that our study didn't have the wow factor that was necessary to uh, uh, make the, the higher-ups buy it, and the reason was that we were mostly talking about the cashiers and not what they considered to be the skilled workers who I'm not allowed to tell you exactly what they did because I'm not allowed to identify the exact retail sector it was in. But the people that they really cared about were people other than the people that we were mostly talking about, who happened to be half their workforce, but anyway. Uh, <clears throat> and the, we came across this paradox, which was interesting, and it, it's one of the things that makes it scientifically interesting, is you find things out. And she said, I really need to work more hours because I'm taking care of these uh, my two parents, and I really need money. But I can't work more hours because I'm taking them to the doctor all the time. So I'm kind of squeezed into this position of, of a paradox. And so I say this to my buddy that's helping me uh, do, because he's going to work out a, the software that's going to enable us to put these worker preferences and worker needs into the scheduling process. And, <clears throat> and he said, well, she should get another job. And I don't know what job he thought she could get with her skill level and her um, regional situation, but it was, I was really struck by the, the distance, it was one of those experiences that made me struck, be struck by the distance between this and this that makes this, it hard to do the science because you don't think of the right way to go, go about things. And it also made us do a, um, uh, a study, a, a review of the literature. And f we realized that almost all the work family studies are on highly paid workers and not on this kind of work. So, moving right along, um, one of the things that uh, might be interesting to you is that we founded San Diego's our research center um, based on this kind of study. And we really got lots of money. I mean, really got millions and millions of dollars from all these uh, fund uh, uh, partnership programs. There was one at Shirk. Uh, that they had cure uh, programs, they have, we had several in, uh, in Quebec. We had uh, the Women in Work Program of Labor Canada that, that financed research in partnership. We had uh, some uh, stuff from Health Canada. And all these programs are gone. 
right? They've just closed the Canadian Women's Health Network uh, just this last month. And so my question is, how could a young researcher now work in the kind of context that has educated me? And the last part of the book is, is about, about pain and how uh, if you are a scientist that empathizes with workers or takes a worker's standpoint, uh, you're going to do one kind of research. And if you uh, have another kind of approach, you're going to do another kind of research. And what happens to you in those two circumstances? So let's start with workers report pain, and some scientists be believe them. And Michelle Vizina, who I'm sure many of you must know, did a huge job to, to get the Quebec government to vote that every five years we would have a study called the ECOTES. I'm not going to tell you what it stands for. You can ask me later. Um, but it would be every five years it would measure what workers' health and exposures were like so that we could monitor occupational health in the Quebec population. And uh, they said, and there was a lot of um, institutions set up to supervise this, this study. The law was passed in 2002. The first study got done in 2007, supervised by the Institute for Statistics in Quebec, the IRSST, who I'm sure you know who it is. Uh, and they have, I just want to point out that they have a board, and that board read every question on the, in the questionnaire, and the board was, was uh, the unions and the employers and some government representatives, uh, the Ministry of Labor, the Bureau, Bureau des Normes, the um, Labor Standards Panel, um, were all part of this study and signed on to it. And uh, well, just, I'll just, just stick with them. The eco test uh, took uh, three years to analyze, so it was done in 2007, the survey. 2010, we submitted all our chapters. Of, there were nine chapters in the report. Uh, they were submitted to outside evaluators. The evaluators made um, comments, you know, just like a journal article. Uh, plus, they were submitted to all the participating institutions and including the governing board of IRSST. And uh, then uh, everybody made changes in response to this, and it was submitted to the Ministry of Labor. And then it saved for a year in the Office of the Ministry of Labor. Nobody heard anything about it. And then in September 2011, uh, September 20th, and at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the ministry released the report. And at 10.48 the next morning, the three employer groups that had participated at every stre stretch of the way denounced it. And the, they just poured out criticism of it to the point where there has not been, I mean, we're in 2015 now. The study should have been done again in 2012. And, uh, and it was, uh, it hasn't been done, and it clearly isn't going to be done. And one of the people whose picture you see uh, is no longer working for her employer because uh, she resigned because she wasn't allowed to speak about the study. I mean, it's really yucky. And so the message that that the scientific communi community is being given by this is let's not talk about pain because what was what were the employers objecting to? They were objecting to the question on musculoskeletal disorders, which they represented as, and I've heard them do it twice in a row, uh, as have you ever felt pain anywhere? And the question in fact was have you during over the last 12 months uh, nearly always or all the time felt persistent pain in one of the sites given that interfered with your daily activity. Okay. So the objection was this is self-reported pain. And uh, the other objection was that, that we showed that of the people feeling pain of this type and absent from work because of that pain, only 20% ever put in a claim to the Occupational Health and Safety Commission. And so the fact that this pain was self-reported and was, and was not being used um, to defraud the taxpayer was a terrible secret that, it, that it had to be kept. And I contrast the treatment of this study and the public denunciation and the humiliations that were inflicted on various people of whose pictures are shown here, 
uh, and who are familiar to some of you and, uh, because some of them are affiliated researchers with this uh, very center. And the, in the chapter, I go into more detail, uh, and I can't do it here because it, it's very technical, but there are people who, instead of viewing worker-reported pain to be a symptom of a medical problem, they think it's a symptom of a psychological problem. And so they speak of uh, catastrophizing. And they have made up an index that is based on questions like, um, uh, I'm afraid to go to work because of, I'm, in, uh, I'm afraid of pain, or questions of that type. And instead of regarding the answers to that questionnaire as a reason to think there might be a reason to be afraid of going back to work, the questions are all analyzed as a symptom of a psychological problem in realizing that their work is really painless. And there's a whole body of work on this. It's being very generously supported by our provincial government agencies. And that has never been denounced in public. So the message scientists are getting is we shouldn't be listening to workers so much. And I think that we have to worry about whether this message is going to succeed in, in uh, as it has succeeded with the ecotest in making sure that this uh, pain is underreported. Okay, the last, this isn't going to be complicated for you, I hope. This is a chapter I have a lot of trouble with um, because the question is at what point do we decide to compensate or to do something about workers' pain? Uh, and how is that point decided? And so, I tell the story in this chapter of how rumor has it that the 0.05 significance level was decided on, which is that a student, R.A. Fisher, Fisher's exact test, father of uh, statistics, um, a student said to him, well, you know, this is all very well, these tests, and they're very interesting, but you come out with a probability that such and such an association is due to chance. What I want to know is when do we decide it's due to chance and when do we decide that we're going to accept that there's really a, a, um, a phenomenon going on here? And Fisher said, I don't know. And he went home and he got in his bath and he's scrubbing his hose and he says, five. Five. I think it'll be five. And for ever after, based on an arbitrary decision of Fisher in his bath, it's been the 0.05 level, but it could have been 0.10, right? Could have been 0.01, could have been anything. It's an arbitrary decision. Why did I, why do I think this is not right? Is that here I am on a bike trip in Peru with my favorite person in the whole world, Pierre, and who bikes. And Pierre and I are going up this beautiful hill in Peru, near, not very far from Machu Picchu. And a dog comes bounding onto the road and bites Pierre in the calf. Huge bite, very impressive. Blood pouring off his leg. And the question is, is Pierre going to get rabies shots? Okay. So we're on this um, bike trip. We've got just a couple of weeks. And Pierre, like all guys, he says, of course not. Why would I get a, why would I get rabies shots? Would mean we'd have to hang around Cusco for the next week. We're on holiday, and there's all these programs in Peru, because Peru is a nice country that with socialized medicine, and you don't even pay for medicine, and they have lots of public health, and uh, there's an anti-rabies campaign, and all the dogs have been vaccinated, and so there's really no reason to worry about this. So, so Pierre says this to me, and I say, sure. Okay, we'll, go, we'll just go ahead. Then we go to sleep, and at 2 in the morning, I wake up, and I, I'm sobbing. Tears rolling off my cheeks. Because I just realized that, you know, maybe there's only one chance in a 1,000. We, in fact, called his daughter, who's the head of public health for the region of the Mauricie in, in Quebec, and we said, what's the chance that Pierre's going to get rabies? He's, she says, no problem. This is his daughter talking. One in a 1,000. And I thought, in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock in the morning, I thought, he's getting rabies shots. One in a thousand, that's much too much of a chance for me to see. Okay? And he got his rabies shots. And so these rabies shots were paid for by Peruvians, right? This lady here and this lady there that had a lot. 
less money than us because there's no, like in Canada, if you try to pay for your health care, you can't in Peru. There's no way to do it. So, and I felt very bad about it, but I wasn't going to put up with one chance in a thousand that Pierre was going to get rabies, right? Because it's Pierre. And so then you think about, I thought about, well, the wives of the asbestos exposed workers, where we're talking, it, it not as, in technical terms, I'm not going to say this right, but it comes down to they have to have a 95% chance, not a one in a thousand chance of getting disease, a 95% chance in order for somebody to do something about it. And that's, there's something wrong about that. So last chapter is just about partnership and, and, and the fact that the partnership, as I said, has been good for our science. It's been, uh, and it, I think it's been good for the unions and for the, for the workers, but uh, it hasn't been, it, at this point in Quebec, we've got austerity. And I really like this cartoon, I don't know if you can see it. It's got three workers holding up the, the stone. You've fired the first one, fired the second one, and the third one obviously can't do the job because he's incompetent, so that's, what is happening with austerity. We're having huge cuts all over our economy. The workers are having a very, very hard time with it. And they're having priorities that don't have much to do with improving science or collaborating with researchers. They're trying to stay alive. So my question is, is a question to you, is with many other progressive scientists, we've sometimes been successful in helping workers in changing law, laws and practices with, with Catherine Lapel. Uh, in helping science evolve, but can we go on? And I put in these pictures because there's, uh, this is Carlos uh, Ibarra and uh, Pamela uh, Estudillo in Chile who are doing wonderful things to, um, with worker-friendly science in Chile. And this is Florent Chapin who's doing wonderful things in France. So in other places, um, people have been able to use this partnership uh, to make their own partnerships and uh, change things in other countries. But I am just not at all sure that we are going to be able to continue here in Canada. So I think that's it. And this is the book. And if you want to read it, um, it's an e-book. Um, and it's uh, also a paperback. And we have copies here. So thank you.